So welcome to the Adam Smith Institute. Um, could I ask you firstly, if you have a mobile phone on it, would you put it to silent uh, now, please, so it doesn't disturb us during, <coughs> during the evening. Um, welcome, as I said, to the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, we have a lecture this evening on uh, could deflation uh, be salvation. There's a seat at the front if anybody wants it. And I think maybe Sam or somebody can organize some at the back, but there's one here if anybody would like it. Um, and uh, George Silgin is going to talk to us for uh, about uh, 30 minutes, and then we will have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions afterwards, and we will aim to finish uh, if we can, no later than 8 o'clock. Um, George Silgin I, is a Professor of Economics uh, at, at the Business College of the University of Georgia. Um, he is a Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and uh, Associate Editor of uh, the splendid Econ Journal, Journal Watch. I've just been handed uh, an article that he did in, uh, looks like, uh, what? where's Tony? Oh, is it? About 2002, I think. In the yeah. Times, was it, or? Uh, FT. In the Financial Times. Godfathers of easy money. <laughs> and he's complaining about how central banks are uh, increasing credit and uh, printing cash and all of these things. Uh, and uh, this could all, all end in tears. <laughs> um, so when they tell you that nobody predicted the cash, the crash, sorry, not the cash, <laughs> when nobody predicted the crash, uh, there are, there is a certain uh, school of economists uh, who did, in fact, raise some uh, issues, uh, and uh, George, in uh, particular, uh, certainly seems to have done that with that that piece, which I wasn't aware of. Um, George is an expert on uh, the theory of money and banking. Uh, he's one of the uh, the uh, founders of the modern free banking school. Uh, he's done research on, on currency in particular uh, and uh, advocates uh, what people call a, a productivity norm allowing uh, falling prices, uh, prices to fall to, to reflect increases in productivity. Um, but his um, controversial topic, I know it's controversial because he got a call from the BBC and a call from a, another TV station today to talk about this, uh, is uh, could deflation be salvation? George. Thanks. Do you need some more, sir? Something? No, I'm all right so far. If you okay. hear me yeah. choking at any point, uh, go ahead and rush and get me one. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see you. Almost SRO crowd. Well, it is just slightly SRO. Um, uh, so, I didn't choose the title about salvation. I don't suppose I've ever really saved anyone. Certainly haven't saved any souls. Uh, but. Uh, while I was writing my notes for the talk today, I decided that, well, actually, maybe it's not such a bad title. I'll get around to <laughs> explaining why. Uh, I want to start my talk with a, a little hypothetical uh, uh, setup and, uh, uh, and a question to go along with it. We, we economists like that sort of thing. Suppose that, uh, suppose that as, if, as, as if by magic, the productivity of all the world's industries and agriculture where to double, just like that, overnight. Next day, they're producing twice as much stuff with the same factors of production. And it keeps on doubling every year, again and again and again. So how, how, how would you feel about that? Would Pretty you feel good? good? Would you like it? Mm -hmm. I think most of us would feel, mm -hmm. that's not so bad. How do you suppose the world's central bankers would feel about it? Well, they'd absolutely be in a, a, a complete, uh, uh, panic. Why? Because, of course, this will cause deflation. And they will no doubt go to Congress arguing that they have to engage in massive quantitative easing and keep doing so forever, be making their balance sheets even larger, even faster than they've been getting lately. Because how else will prices be not only kept from falling, but kept rising at the minimally safe rate of 2% or so a year, soon no doubt to be changed to something like 4 or 5% <laughs> as needed. And so the question is, why do the central bankers think so differently than we do about 
this kind of thing. And the reason I submit is that they are unaware of a distinction that to all of you is at least implicitly not so, not, not terribly unclear. It's a distinction between good deflation and bad deflation. Now bad deflation, of course, we've also all heard about. It's the kind of deflation you get when there's not enough being spent, when there's a collapse of spending in the economy, especially because the money supply has shrunk for some reason, which it sometimes does in financial crises, or because people are hoarding money, or usually because of a little bit of each. This sort of deflation has happened uh, recently, in 2008 to 2009. Uh, it happened most notoriously in the early 1930s and then again in the mid-30s. Uh, so we all know what bad deflation is, but once again, this is one of two kinds of deflation. It's deflation caused by people not spending on goods, so the flow of spending is interrupted. Firms can't recoup their expenses, on average, if at all. And uh, so there are losses, few goods are sold while prices are finding their way down. And uh, unemployment, as well as uh, uh, other problems, emerge as a result of this. The other kind of deflation is the kind our hypothetical scenario uh, <coughs> gave rise to. Of course, it did so in a particularly dramatic way, yet this other kind of deflation uh, can occur in a much more, let's say, realistic uh, uh, version. Uh, whenever there are improvements, general improvements in the state of economic productivity. In that case, what's happening, of course, is that the world's factors of production are generally, or on average, becoming more uh, productive. More goods are produced from given factors. That means unit production costs are falling, on average, of course, the change is typically in, uh, greater for certain goods than for others. Some goods may suffer productivity setbacks. But the point is that good deflation is deflation within the limits of productivity improvements where the rate of deflation is no greater than the rate of productivity growth. In other words, prices are never falling more than the unit costs of the goods concerned. That kind of deflation has been extremely uncommon. Most of us have never seen it. I think in the United States they may have let it happen once, in 1954, in the last two <coughs> centuries so far. But it was, before the Great Depression, an extremely common phenomenon. In fact, it was rather <coughs> typical that over time, as goods became cheaper to produce, which of course they, they tended to do over the course of that century, century as today, uh, their prices actually fell, reflecting more or less that fact. That is, the rates of deflation where, for the most part, with the exception of certain financial crises, which of course occurred back then as well, rates of deflation tended to mirror productivity growth, more or less. And as a result, that deflation, which occurred, was not harmful, was not associated, associated with depression, was not a cause for holding the monetary system to be performing badly. Now, um, uh, as a result of the Great Depression, particularly, uh, deflation generally got a bad name. That is, we had such a bout of the bad sort of deflation that gave rise to new economic thinking that ended up overlooking the very possibility of the other sort of deflation and, more importantly, ended up informing monetary policies and central bank behavior such as ultimately would eradicate the good kind of deflation along with the other kind for the most part, uh, even though, of course, productivity is kept on and right on improving, at least uh, in uh, normal times. Um, and as a result, even the history of deflation had been rewritten. There was a book uh, that had that uh, a very good economic, uh, let me step back a bit, sorry. Uh, you know that uh, modern economists have had the tendency of referring here in uh, Great Britain to the Great Depression, meaning not, not the one of the 30s, they also call that a Great Depression, but <coughs> the so-called Great Depression of 1873 to 1896. Did you know there was a Great Depression yes. then? <laughs> Nobody back then knew it, but economists figure out, figured out that there must have been such a depression. Imagine a depression that lasts 23 years. Why? Why prices were falling during that time. 
So there must have been a Great Depression. Fortunately, a very good economic historian named Saul uh, bothered to write a little book with the very good title, The Myth of the Great Depression. It wasn't about the 30s. It was about the phony Great Depression that has been identified as such because of this new tendency for economists to assume that any period of falling prices must be a period when people are out of work and so on, even though the, the facts of the matter say otherwise. People were busy shopping. They weren't trying to find jobs. They were too busy buying all the new goodies. Uh, now, uh, that's just an example of how far, the, uh, how far we have gone from the once common understanding that deflation didn't have to be a bad thing, that there was a good sort. Yet even today, of course, uh, central bankers don't go so far as to prevent all prices from falling. They have to put up with some prices falling. Prices of computers, for example, or let's pick an even better example, I think, though I don't have one yet, iPads or cell phones, right? Those are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper anywhere you measure their price, right? However you adjust for quality. But think about it, though these products such as those are exceptional in that the productivity gains has been, have been much greater than for other goods. In general, the tendency this century and the last have, has been the same as in the previous one, where most goods are becoming cheaper to produce. Some a lot, like those, some not so much, and only a relatively small number have had their unit costs of production increase. So why haven't we seen lower prices? Because what the central banks of the world are in fact doing is saying that for every good like iPads that they allow to get cheaper, by hook or by crook, there must be some other goods whose price rises, otherwise we'll be in terrible trouble. And they see to it that that is in fact what happens through monetary expansion. Think about it. Think about the logic. Uh, so we don't see good deflation, except we see relative deflation of certain goods. But if all goods get cheaper, or the vast majority of them then do, nevertheless, the, the vast majority of prices are kept up and even kept right, uh, made to, to continuously rise. <coughs> uh, there's a kind, by the way, when I pose the question to central bankers and I'm afraid most other monetary economists, uh, uh, that, uh, that after all, they see no problem in the price of computers and such falling because their unit costs of production are declining. Therefore, why shouldn't they equally see no problem if that's generally happening? Happening, they, they come up with the, the, the usual response that, oh no, this would cause depression. This would be a bad situation. And they bring up arguments about creditors and debtors, debtors and such, uh, and I'm happy to respond to those uh, to explain why it doesn't apply in this in kind of instance, uh, if, uh, if you like, in the question session. But the point is that they're guilty of what I think is a, a vast reverse fallacy of composition. That is, they think that where, whereas, in fact, there's no reason why what's true for single goods can't be good, true for goods in general. Uh, they think that, in fact, it's a fallacy of, of composition to assume that because it's okay for the price of computers to fall, it, it must be okay for the prices of things, all of the things whose productivity is improving to, to fall. Now, that's just one of the kind of logical, I think, contradictions or mistakes that uh, uh, afflicts today's monetary economists and central bankers. Uh, there's another one. If you press uh, these same people on the matter of adverse supply shocks, they'll readily concede that these shocks, that is, occasions when productivity suffers big setbacks, warrant not stabilizing prices, not clinging to the same inflation target, but allowing prices to rise in response to the productivity setback. And here again, I put it to the central bankers. If it isn't sensible to try to keep prices from changing when there are productivity setbacks. If it's, in that case, okay and even desirable to allow the prices to rise, after all, preventing them from rising would be to afflict producers with the 
uh, with a kind of double jeopardy, right? They're already suffering from supply setbacks, and now there's going to be a contraction of spending to keep prices from rising. Most economists will say, oh no, we don't want that. And I put it to them. If there's a positive supply shock, why then shouldn't your policy deviate in that case by allowing prices to fall? Oh no, that's deflation. Mind you, this price is falling. When prices fall in connection with productivity, wages don't fall, right? They don't fall. I'll come to that later. So you mustn't think, oh, I'm advocating wage deflation. I agree with the usual consensus about that. It's not the sort of thing you want to try and recommend, at least not out loud. Uh, but uh, but it, in fact, I'm not uh, recommending it. Now, um, another way of putting this whole point of view is that what really counts for general stability <coughs> isn't stability of the price level or the inflation rate, as typical uh, monetary economists have it, but stability of spending, the total level of spending. We now fortunately have some economists calling for stabilization of nominal GDP as an alternative to stabilizing the price, except that most of them would have the amount of spending grow over time so as to keep prices stable or even rising. In other words, they wouldn't allow uh, a downward trend in prices even if that trend reflected productivity improvements over time. But in any event, if you really took if you really took stability of spending as the true desideratum of policy, then uh, the point is that if there is uh, productivity, there are improvements to productivity, right? What's happening is uh, P, uh, output is going up, the number of goods to be purchased are going up, then with stable spending, it, it translates into the goods being sold for lower prices so that the greater quantity sells for a total amount of uh, money that's no different than before. So the flow of spending is able to revitalize itself. Uh, firm revenues on average cover firm costs allowing for normal profits even though their product prices are falling but it says it should be because their costs are falling. So we want normal profits but not abnormal profits. Um, another way of putting this is that if you allow prices to fall as productivity improves, that's equivalent to stabilizing the factor prices. You're keeping those stable. And this is another place where conventional monetary theory gets things wrong. In a world where productivity is itself stationary, it's nothing's happening, uh, then of course stabilizing the product price level, the output price level, is the same as stabilizing the input price level. You're not really having to choose. So when, in that case, when a central bank keeps prices generally stable, it's keeping wages and factor prices stable too. There's no difference. But if productivity is improving, think of what that means, right? For labor, for example, it means that the real wage rate must increase one way or the other. But that means that there's really a choice. You can't stabilize the factor prices and the output prices. You have to choose. If you stabilize the output prices, now you're destabilizing the factor prices. You're, calling fa you're causing factor price inflation. On the other hand, if you stabilize the factor prices, you must allow output price deflation. So the old argument that well, we're, just, we're just calling for stable prices ceases to be satisfying, satisfactory because what prices is it now we can ask that you really think should be stable? And I'll argue that the case, the, 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 the consideration of those two options, the realization that you have to choose between them, uh, uh, in turn leads to the conclusion that you, get, you avoid trouble best by stabilizing the factor prices. Here's another point, by the way. Suppose I say we, we're, we're keeping wages stable. That doesn't mean, oh, you have to spend your whole life making the same amount, right? That's not what it means. The average person can get raises. There's a common misunderstanding about that. But the youngster who starts out where you started gets the same starting wage you started with. That's what wage stability means. It doesn't mean that people don't get raises. Okay, so put that out, out of your mind. Yeah. No, there's not. I did not just make a logical mistake. It can happen. Never mind. People are, think about it. Anyway, <clears throat> right. 
So, um, did I, did I talk to half hour already? No, no, no. you talked 17 minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, good. I don't have that much to go. So, uh, so let's think about the, the, the implications of this, because ultimately, the, you know, if it were just a matter of how we make people enjoy their uh, productivity gains, uh, there wouldn't be much to this. But what I want to convince you is that not so much that there's no harm done in letting by letting prices fall to reflect productivity gains. But rather that if monetary policy, if and when it interferes with price reductions that would otherwise prevent, uh, reflect productivity gains, it actually causes the same kinds of problems that it causes if, in the absence of such gains, it allows inflation to break out. It's the same thing. The consequences are the same. So think about this. Suppose we have a world of constant productivity. So there are no productivity improvements. So then, I think we agree, right? Uh, st stability, the productivity norm, which is my name for my preferred policy, it still ca it itself calls for a stable price level, for keeping the price level stable. And if you, if you want to interpret the argument about the, to be around the, the inflation rate, we can do that too. So zero inflation, if you want to up it to 2%, fine. Right. But anyway, there's no difference between the productivity norm policy and a stable price level policy in this case. Right. So, in that case, we would also say that as long as prices are stable, the money stock is neither growing excessively rapidly nor growing insufficiently rapidly. So now, if that's true, now we must ask, suppose productivity is growing at 2% a year, which is a pretty good clip, but not, not at all unheard of. Suppose it's growing 2% a year. Then, in that case, uh, if you're going to keep the price level stable, if the central bank's going to stabilize prices, it must let nominal spending grow 2% a year to, to keep prices up despite the growth in the quantity of goods that's going on. Everybody follow that? You need 2% more spending a year to allow 2% more product to be sold at the same prices as in the past. Right? So you're also inflating factor prices, about 2%. On the other hand, if you have a productivity norm, you would keep the flow of spending as before, with prices simply falling to reflect the productivity gains falling 2% a year. But now, of course, there is a disagreement about what constitutes excessive monetary policy. Is the excessive money creation going on in the case where prices are kept stable, but incomes are generally rising, or in the case where prices fall and income remains as before? And one way to think about this is to, again, consider that factor prices are growing. I don't have time to go into all the arguments, but in fact, the danger of, in, of destabilizing monetary policy is a danger particularly associated with excess growth in nominal expenditures, in demand. When demand is excessive, it stimulates things, right? When demand grows uh, uh, to the point where eventually factor prices much ca much r must catch up with it, the first round effects of this are what the economists who understood these things once upon a time used to call profit inflation. Right? Just as a repeating flow of spending keeps profits normal and a shrinking one causes losses because you can't make up for your historical costs, a growing uh, amount of spending, as is needed in this case to keep prices from declining, also means that firms are getting more revenue than they dished out on average, which means that until factor prices respond to the increased revenues, firms are enjoying supernormal profits. Supernormal profits are the name for when they happen generally and not just here and there, are the name another name for a boom. And one of the manifestations of such a boom, especially if the source of the greater expenditure is central bank expansion, which typically is undertaken by means of lower interest rates, is a particular in boom in asset markets. And an unsustainable boom in asset markets, because the profits are themselves unsustainable as soon as the factor costs rise to catch up with what's happening with the rate of expenditure, then the profits go away and then the asset markets are revealed to be overpriced. 
That's the same kind of story you can easily tell in a world of zero productivity gains when the central bank is going from stable prices to outright inflation. But in this case, it's, it's the productivity that changes, and you're going from stable prices to stable prices when you should be going to deflation. But it's the same underlying problem of asset uh, relative price, uh, sorry, of profit inflation and associated potential unsustainable <coughs> asset price boom. Fine. If this theory is right, you can have an asset price bubble even when there's no increase in inflation. Hmm. Has anyone ever heard of that happening before? If you think hard about it, you'll not, you'll not have to think too far in the past. Let's talk about it. Let's talk first about the past. 1922 to 1929 in the United States in particular, perfectly stable price level. Modern economists would say, well, here surely is, is macroeconomic stability, sound central bank policy, except it was a period of rapid productivity growth. And if you look at expenditures, even adjusting for population, they're going up and up and up. Per capita expenditure goes up tremendously. It increases by 50% during this same period. The other things going up, of course, are real estate and the stock market, but not, as we now know, in a sustainable way. Or how about 1995 to 2000, the dot-com boom? Same thing. The central bank, the Fed, the other central banks as well, they didn't think there was anything wrong when the inflation rate was modest and so on. But that was the first half of a two-act uh, uh, show of rapid productivity improvements. We had a so-called uh, productivity surge that began in the 1990s, was interrupted by the dot-com crash, and then was renewed until the more recent crash. And throughout both of those parts of the surge, the central banks of the world were maintaining, were, were maintaining easy money policies, but justifying those policies on the grounds that the inflation rate was not any higher than it had been before the surge. But of course, according to the theory that I'm going over, the inflation rate needed to get lower as productivity surged in order to maintain the same structure of the economy, a sustainable structure. So we had the boom uh, bust cycle of 1995 to 2000. Then, of course, the Fed was at it again after that bust, holding interest rates down for a very low to very low levels, of course, notoriously low, negative in real terms, when the, uh, uh, when in fact, uh, and justifying that by pointing to the lack of any serious increase in inflation. Since the policies didn't go, make the inflation rate go up, they must not have involved excessively easy money, though the productivity surge had, be, had been renewed again. Finally, I'm afraid, another example may be happening now, where we're seeing asset prices rising. This time there are a number of factors involved, including the fact that all the quantitative easing in the world won't, isn't sufficing, uh, in the states especially, but also elsewhere, to get banks and firms to unhoard the massive amounts of cash they've accumulated because the investment environment just simply hasn't recovered enough to make them want to do so. So a lot of the money is either piling up in reserves or where it isn't piling up in reserves, it's going into those particular asset markets where the interest rate sensitivity is especially great and you know where that is. I think the FTSE achieved a Another record high today, by the way. Uh, so, uh, well, this leads me to defend my defense of the AEI's title for this talk. Uh, uh, I'll say that uh, even if perhaps defla it is going too far to say that deflation is uh, salvation, it can, after all, keep you from going to hell now and then. So uh, mm -hmm. that's all I have to say, and I'll open up the floor for questions. George, we have um, uh, 30 minutes or so for uh, questions and discussion, and I hope you'll join us for a drink at the back afterwards. Um, while people are, are formulating their, their questions, can I just uh, say, I mean, there is a sort of visceral fear of uh, deflation among politicians and indeed central bankers. 
Um, firstly, they say interest rates, you know, you can't have negative interest rates. Yeah. Um, secondly, they say, well, people will just put off spending because they know tomorrow prices will be lower, so we'll get into a downward spiral. And thirdly, going back to Keynes, they say, well, um, nobody likes a pay cut, so we've got to have a little bit of inflation, so people think they're still earning right, yes. more money even though they're not. That's right, yeah. So all how do you get those, out of that? Well, they're all wrong. Uh, <laughs> they're all wrong. Uh, the first one was about, uh, uh, so remind me again. The negative interest yeah, rates. Yeah, negative interest rates. So, right. Um, theory gets you out of that because uh, the, the, the real interest rate, right, that is the one where you don't take deflation into account, is always going to be somewhat higher than the rate of productivity growth. So as long as the deflation rate is just equal to the rate of the productivity, of productivity growth, you never run into the negative interest rate equilibrium. Now, you can run into that if you have the bad kind of deflation. So that's why we worry about negative in equilibrium interest rates in that case. But the argument will not go through, like many arguments of this sort, it matters what causes the deflation to whether the, 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 the argument is valid or not. But you, 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 even in a zero productivity economy, you have a, a, an underlying consumption loan rate of interest. Uh, but uh, and you add to that the productivity growth rate, and you get the bottom line uh, real, uh, real equilibrium rate. And so that's that. The, uh, I love the one about people putting off spending. Uh, you know, it, it brings to mind Buridan's ass, right? Uh, starving between two uh, uh, piles of hay because it can't decide which one to eat. And so, according to this hypothesis, human beings are worse than asses, or at least as bad, because they can't bring themselves to spend any money because it. Uh, Prices, goods become available at a better and better bargain the longer they wait, so they don't spend anything. Oh my! Uh, no, it doesn't work that way, and it didn't happen that way in the in the 19th century. Uh, eventually, uh, there's something called the real balance effect that kicks in, and this is where, as prices fall, your money balances uh, become greater in real terms, the value of the cash in your pocket, and it starts to burn a bigger hole, and at some point you spend it. Mm. So that's the end of that. And that's why people, there, weren't mass, there wasn't any mass starvation in the mid-1880s as people waited for cheaper prices to come, which of course everybody had every reason back then to think prices would only get lower and lower and lower, which they tended to do, and yet people went shopping. This is something apparently central bankers need to sit down and figure out, but I don't think it's going to, should trouble the rest of us for too long. And the last one was downward. Keynes. Oh, downward. Well, I already kind of addressed that. Yes. Um, if, you're, if you're only having uh, the uh, uh, price level fall at the rate of productivity growth, this means that on average uh, wage rates do not have to decline or have to decline only uh, here and there at the st to the same extent that they would if there was no productivity gain but you were targeting zero inflation. So that, that's that. In fact, by the way, if you read the general theory very carefully, he considers these productivity norm arguments. Uh, the, the, his discussion is masked in the usual obfuscating lingo that Keynes liked to use in order to make his theories appear more innovative than they really were. But if you, if you read it carefully, I've read it pretty carefully, I've even written an article about it. At one point, he actually concedes the uh, point that it might be better, that it would be better to stabilize a wage index rather than a price index. That's the productivity norm. Two pages later, he takes it back and goes for price level stabilization. Keynes is in that book a price level stabilizationist, to be, to be fair. He's just, however, <laughs> assuming throughout the whole book that you're in an economy where the price level is way below equilibrium and that's why you can spend your way into greater production. Those economists who assume that Keynes would have thought this generally to be the case, I think, are, are not being fair to him. Anyway, that's argument three. Right, thank you. Uh, ben, at the back there. I was just wondering, um, so you, you made the argument that factor prices can't catch, or take a while to catch up with um, the general inflation rate. Yeah, yeah. So that's how you get the uh, super normal profit. Can be, yeah. Uh, across the economy. But I was wondering, <coughs> if the central bank had a well publicized target, wouldn't rational expectations mean that factor prices instantly adjusted upwards, just um, always, to keep in mind? 
It would only be if the central bank was unclear about what it was doing. But the the thing that the peop the, the thing that's unclear and that's difficult to predict is the rate of productivity change, right? So even if the central bank tells you we're going to have prices grow, grow the price level rise at a smooth, continuous 2% rate, right? That doesn't tell you what's, that doesn't allow you to predict uh, wage inflation or the equilibrium wage rate, which depends in that case on the rate of productivity growth, which is itself notoriously uh, difficult to predict. And so rational expectations don't get you anywhere. Um, and there you go, yeah. Uh, so I'm jumping there. Could you say who you are and where you're from? And Me? Yeah. yeah. yeah um, my name's Nicholas Coon. I work for the railways. Um, but I like your idea of deflation because actually when you talk about wages being frozen, if you have deflation, of course, you're getting a pay rise anyway. Yes. Because you're, every year you're getting richer and richer. And there are pensioners who don't get any advantage mm. under current schemes unless they beg for it don't get their share of productivity gains, which they would naturally get under such an arrangement if they had fixed incomes. But I think the question is, I mean, in terms of your right about spe deferring spending, if you're buying computers, yes, you can. You can say, I want a better model, I'll wait two, two years' time. But with food, of course, you've got to eat every day. So you're going to buy your food. You don't have to wait till it comes down. Right? That's crazy. Um, but my question is really, do you think that if we could diversify the energy source for transport, that that would bring the prices down for food? I'm not talking about computers which come down because of the economies of scale. But the problem with food is we rely on this wretched thing called oil. Hmm. And oil, every vehicle runs on oil, so we have to get it from the Arab world, which of course is unstable. Prices get up all the time, we get held to ransom. If we had more electric cars, shale gas cars, things running on something else, you had a diversity of supply there for a free market in energy for vehicles, you would get a reduction in transport costs, and you would then for get a reduction in the price of food, which a lot of the cost of food is comes from transport costs, transporting the food, of course. Uh, have you got any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I have no expert thoughts on that, to be honest. Uh, I'm, I'm, my, my expertise consists of, of, uh, of of arguing that uh, if uh, other clever people find ways to lower food prices, that by God the food prices ought to be allowed to fall in that case, uh, but not in in uh, in actually coming up with or endorsing particular schemes for lowering prices of food. That is, I, I, it sounds good to me, but I'm not an expert on on uh, on that that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, but of course. Uh, uh, any productivity gains should themselves, any, any devices for enhancing productivity, lowering real costs, are themselves desirable. My point is that the other thing is that's desirable is that the prices of goods should fall in a way that most transparent, that reflects what's been happening to productivity in the most transparent way possible. Why should people have to be puzzled about whether things are getting cheaper or not. Why can't they be allowed to see them getting cheaper uh, and to benefit uh, from them doing so in, in the most straightforward possible way? This is the thing. And there are distributional elements to this story. Uh, uh, and uh, the question of debtor-creditor injustice comes up. Again, the usual argument, well, when prices fall, of course, uh, the debtors are really getting squeezed because they're paying back uh, dollars or pounds that are each worth after the loan comes due more than they were when the loan, terms of the loans were set, a loan, uh, uh, were set forth. Uh, and that's true if the productivity improvements uh, uh, are unanticipated, but when the source of the deflation is a productivity gain, there's two surprises, of an unexpected productivity gain. There are two surprises. One surprise is that prices fall when you didn't expect it, right? Because under my rule, they would fall. The other surprise is that productivity improved when you didn't expect it. Now think of the people who wrote the loan contract and not having anticipated either of these things. If they had anticipated the income improvement, they would have written for a higher rate of interest if that were the only fact that they had anticipated. But if they anticipated only the deflation, they would have written for a lo lower one. Guess what happens if they had perfectly anticipated both? Nothing. 
It turns out that the wrong interest rate is still the right interest rate in this case. There's no justification for thinking that a perfect foresight uh, planning would have led to any different contract at all. So the usual argument that sounds so wonderful and correct and is correct when the source of deflation is uh, uh, shrinking demand just won't go through when the reason is productivity gains. And uh, this is another one where I've had to go back and forth with other economists who just refuse to get it. By the way, Irving Fisher got it. He's the one who first came up with the interest rate adjustment for expected deflation and inflation. But if you read Fisher carefully, he also has this other thing that will go on if what's happening is productivity gains. Uh, gentlemen, uh, back here, yeah. Yeah, I, I was wondering because you're. Um, can, can you tell us who you are? Just I'm just, uh, my name is Matthew Ryder. I'm just a random student. Um, random student, okay. Oh, go ahead and ask anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your suggestions uh, about how kind of, um, obviously, in some sectors we get kind of massive price rises, in some sectors we get massive, well, put it to be rises, in some sectors we may well get the opposite. Um, so even if the, uh, the central banks do kind of um, target for kind of um, deflation occasion, they do allow deflation to happen. They do? I mean, but so even if they do, even if they were to allow, oh, even if they were to, even if they okay. were to allow, allow mm -hmm. deflation to happen, well, mm -hmm. presumably in some, like, as in your scenario, presumably in some sectors that would still cause a lot of economic damage, in some specific sectors, because it's only ever an average. But those sectors aren't suffering from deflation. They're suffering from the fact that they're, they're becoming less productive by, by, by assumption, right? The only, the, the, right? So at any given time, of course, we live in a dynamic economy and some, some, a lot of things are happening. For example, the relative demand for different goods changes, right? So we may have perfectly stable aggregate spending, but people stop spending on hoop skirts. Well, should we call this a failure of the macroeconomic policy now? Do we have to s try to have the central bank pump money in, uh, into the economy so that the demand for hoop skirt, uh, skirts is revived? Uh, it's an extreme case, but the point is the answer is no. That's a flagging industry, not because of macroeconomic policy errors, but because, well, because it's a flagging industry. <laughs> Similarly, with productivity, uh, some firms will suffer, some industries will suffer productivity setbacks uh, and so will some firms uh, suffer relative productivity setbacks, and this is going to lead to failures and trouble, uh, but this is a microeconomic problem. Those problems would still arise under any conceivable monetary policy, except that they might be disguised some, uh, in the short run, but the only consequence of that uh, short run uh, 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 accomplishment is to delay desirable microeconomic uh, redistributions that eventually must take place anyway and presumably to waste resources in the process. So macroeconomic policy is never supposed, should never be about helping particular firms and industries. It should be about seeing to it that the representative firm or typical firm or average firm isn't losing money. That, that does mean that something's gone haywire with the monetary system. Uh, David Brand, you're yes. a sort of uh, random student too, aren't you? Well, I'm no, a retired IT consultant, but pretty random also. <laughs> um, two points. First of all, uh, with your, your comment that deflation doesn't mean that people delay spending, mm -hmm. uh, I was just thinking with the growth of computing power and its incredible uh, increasing cheapness, people have bought more and more, spent more and more on them. Um, and less and less. Uh, but the, my question, actually, is I wonder if you could just clarify a point for me. You said that bad, one aspect of bad deflation was that people don't spend money. So well, much. it's really a cause and rather than a, yes, okay, it's a, but, it's but a possible with good cause. Inflation, surely will the same thing not happen because prices will fall, so people won't have to spend so much on what they were buying anyway. All right, they may spend a bit more, but the rest they'll save and won't spend. Well, what, what happens is the prices fall so as to uh, uh, allow people to keep on spending this, to, 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 so as to uh, allow the extra goods to be sold while people still spend the same amount. So there's no reason to assume uh, uh, that, uh, that by, the, the whole point is that 
if the spending stream remains itself stable, uh, the fall in prices is simply the economy's way of, of shedding the extra goods that increased productivity puts out. Now, in, it's true that for any particular good, the, demand, the total spent on it may go up or may go down. But as long as the stream of spending as a whole is kept stable, the, the average producer is going to get back what the average producer has uh, uh, laid out in expenses plus a normal interest return. Uh, so that's the goal. Now, of course, it can happen that while productivity is improving, people also decide to hold more money, to increase their demand for money. That is, uh, as economists like to say, that there's a decline in velocity. But in that case, policy would call for, my policy would call for monetary expansion to uh, uh, accommodate the increased demand for money balances. So this isn't saying that there can't be occasions when the demand for money is growing as well as the supply of goods and where therefore there's some call for monetary expansion, that's fine. Uh, to that extent I'm for monetary expansion. I'm not for it to increase for, to, for the sole purpose of propping up prices that are tending to sag owing to productivity gains. Yes. Uh, yeah, right at the back there. Can you uh, say who you are again? Uh, uh, yes, uh, David Farley, I work for uh, Standard Bank. So um, how is your rule system um, better, uh, if you could sort of give, the, give us the highlights of why it is better than a pure objective gold standard? Well, they're not necessarily different. A gold standard, the gold standard, I mean the real one before the war, and starting roughly in the uh, 18, early 1870s, that gold standard, of course, produced the so-called Great Depression, or First Great Depression, and similar uh, long-run price reductions in most of the, in all of the gold standard countries, and the rate of deflation in those cases was approximately the same as the rate of productivity growth. Now, you might think, oh, well, that could only be a remarkable coincidence, but actually not. It was, uh, it was exactly what you'd expect if uh, uh, the rates of improvement of productivity, uh, rates of productivity improvement in industries in general was not kept up, were not kept matched by the productivity of gold, the gold industry. So, uh, so you had a tendency for prices to decline gradually. Now it wasn't a permanent tendency because eventually you'd get discoveries or new processes, Australia, California, cyanide, all that sort of thing, so that the very long run tendency was for prices to come back to where they started. But uh, there could be very long intervals in between where something like a productivity norm situation uh, prevailed. So the gold standard was not bad as a rough and ready way of uh, effect, giving effect to this kind of ideal. Uh, so what I'm saying is you don't necessarily have to choose between what I'm advocating and the gold standard. And I would go further than that and say I'm not advocating any particular central bank policy. Uh, I certainly don't mean to suggest that central banks are the only or the best means for having uh, a, a sound policy. I'm against central banks, it's another lecture, but I think we can do much better than that. Uh, so this is a policy ideal, but it doesn't imply that, it, that, that the policy, it isn't to imply that the policy in question is one that can only be put into effect or approximated through deliberate central planning. Uh, I, I would never expect central planners to put this policy into effect, nor do I think they would be capable of doing it well even if they tried. <laughs> uh, who else we got? Um, uh, yeah, gentlemen at the front and then we'll come, come to the back. Yeah, well, uh, my name's John Hunter from Australia. So, um, perfect productivity increased, and then you say reduce prices. Why not uh, get increase wages instead of reduce prices with the productivity? productivity increase? Well, you can do it that way, yeah. but then you have to expand the money stream, uh, uh, have monetary expansion to match productivity gains so that spending rises. The problem is that this is more, this poses greater dangers of short-run uh, in, instability, particularly since there can be uh, lags between the uh, improvements in productivity and corresponding uh, wage inflation, 
and during that time profits can be uh, artificially swelled and that's what that sort of thing creates uh, asset bubbles. Also when we rely as we do now on nominal money wage growth to uh, capture productivity gains instead of simply letting workers go out and buy stuff that costs less with their with their stable wages. Uh, we leave a, a certain people out of the picture I mentioned in particular those on fixed pensions who cannot in the United States they're constantly arguing about uh, keeping up with the CPI, keeping up with inflation, right, and getting the social security payments properly adjusted. But the whole discussion leaves out productivity. As far as productivity or gains are concerned, the pensioners are stuck. They never get any. And uh, that's, that's something that's omitted from the debate. So I think that relying, although it sounds good, well, just let give workers raises for all their, whenever there's general improvements in productivity, it actually isn't the most equitable way to get the productivity gains to the people who are entitled to take a share of them, to all of them. As well as having the other macroeconomic potential problems that I mentioned. All right. Uh, Right at the back, Nico. Ah, sorry, let me stand. Um, Nico Sarelamus, my name. Do you personally feel satisfied about the current data and indicators that would allow you to make a correct diagnosis between bad inflation and good inflation? I mean, say you're in the in the central bank and you are one of the you know board of uh, members, and they're discussing. They see the prices go down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you have to make, um, you know, say you have ten members saying, let's print money. Yes. And, you know, would you feel confident to say, let's not do nothing because this is one of the good sources of in inflation, deflation, sorry? Well, uh, uh, oddly enough, I would, uh, despite my being completely cynical, because uh, one of the wonderful things about productivity norm is it has it is actually saying not that central banks should respond to productivity innovations, but that they shouldn't. Right? So here's what let's talk about this price stabilizing central bank. Price stabilizing central bank has to make sure that it that it responds with monetary expansion, setting velocity aside, right? It has to respond to those changes in velocity, right? We talked about it has to try and predict, to anticipate and respond to growth in the supply factors of production and growth in or changes in productivity. Failure to make the money supply adjust in connection with either of those or to anticipate the need for adjustments in either of those means that it uh, uh, doesn't achieve its policy goal. Right? The price level must change. Well, I'm telling it do not bother to try and predict productivity changes. Leave them alone. Just stabilize spending, right? And that means, effectively, all the central bank has to forecast is the rate of, of factor in supply increase, which turns out to be much more stable than productivity. Productivity is the hardest factor for central banks to predict. So this is a lower information requirement, a lower forecasting requirement. It would make central banks' task much easier than what they're presently trying to do, assuming that they're sincere, uh, if they were indeed to try to do it instead. Right? So it, it involves less information uh, requirements not more. I've had uh, many people ask me, not, you, you haven't asked the question this way, but I've had many people say, well, how are we going to predict the productivity gains to put your policy into effect? As if my policy was that we have to make sure we adjust the price level to, to have it reflect those gains. That's not the point at all. All you have to do is keep the flow of spending stable, which is relatively easy. You don't have to predict the productivity gains at all because the central bank doesn't respond to those. Prices do instead. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, did, did you want to come in? No. There's one right here. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't see that. Right, yeah. yes, on you go. Tell us who you are. Uh, young Kwan, another random student. Everybody here is random. <laughs> I'm the only one who's... <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned, that, uh, you mentioned that the Great Depression was the origins of U.S. reflationary policy. 
but you also mentioned that the great uh, the Roaring Twenties, there wasn't any price decrease to reflect the productivity growth. Yes, that's well, true. What is the cause of um, okay. price de uh, non-price deflation from the Roaring Twenties? To be perfectly fair, the idea that uh, deflation and depression must necessarily go hand in hand really started to take hold in the United States uh, after the 2021 crisis, which was another deflationary, bad deflation crisis. Um, it started to take hold then. Nevertheless, uh, that, I don't think that has much to do with the fact that they didn't let prices fall in the uh, later 20s. A lot of people have, have, uh, 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 have assumed that Benjamin Strong, then the head of the Fed, was deliberately trying to stabilize prices in the mid to late 20s. Um, I think the evidence for that is extremely weak. I think what he was trying to do was to help his friend Montague Norman to stay on the gold standard despite uh, uh, a pound that was uh, uh, a pre-war setback at its pre-war parity. The tendency under the circumstances was for uh, Britain to hemorrhage gold to other countries uh, uh, until its prices fell enough to make the gold standard their sustainable. Uh, he went to, he held uh, a meeting, a meeting was arranged by Benjamin Strong uh, for him and for a couple other world central bankers where Montague tried to talk everybody into expanding the money supply in the countries that would otherwise receive gold to try to you know, uh, uh, tilt tilt things back, <laughs> tilt the, so the flow, gold wouldn't flow as rapidly out. Strong was the only one who went along with it. And there, there's your answer to how how prices were propped up in the U.S. during that time. Uh, David, did you, did you want to come back on this? Well, could, uh, quick question. Uh, we, we talked to you talked to about gold supply and the gold standard. <clears throat> could you comment about Bitcoin, where the supply know. is absolutely limited? That's right. another lecture too. I've heard him. It is well, another lecture. <laughs> it is, but I'd be it's so well. <laughs> so um, well, uh, I'm not sure I can comment on it. I'm not sure I can make this the 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 segue to the topic today. But yes, Bitcoin. So I call Bitcoin synthetic commodity money, um, and uh, it's a synthetic commodity money because it has features of real commodity money that is natural commodity monies and of fiat monies. The feature of the natural commodity money is that the supply is absolutely limited. Nobody can manipulate it. Uh, it's, it's, it's limited if, as if so many bitcoins had been put into the ground, except uh, uh, unlike a natural commodity, there are no supply innovations and no supply shocks. Uh, the supply will grow at a predetermined rate until it doesn't grow anymore after there are 21 million bitcoins out there or just before we ever reach that amount tapers off. So there you go. Now what's cool about that? What's cool about it is you, in the in, that you have a synthetic commodity that is free of both the blind forces of nature and the arbit arbitrary manipulation of authorities. So happens that the way the supply behaves under Bitcoin is hardly likely to be ideal and it wouldn't lead to a productivity norm because eventually the supply of money couldn't grow at all, which is too going to result in, in some bad deflation, presumably. Uh, uh, the good news is, I've been talking to Bitcoin types, uh, there are all these fanatics out there, and they love to talk about Bitcoin endlessly, but in this case it was useful for me to ask them, can you design something just like this, but with a supply function <coughs> does all kinds of macroeconomic trip, tricks? Uh, and the answer basically boils down to uh, this. It is now apparently possible for me or anyone else to say to any of the world's central bankers, you tell me how, what you think your job is, what the best way for you to manage money is. They give you the answer and you say, I can design a commodity uh, uh, synthetically with a software program that can't be hacked, which once you sent it in motion will do everything you say you're supposed to do, but will really do it, <laughs> which you won't. That's that is powerful, that is to me a very powerful development. It doesn't mean the central bankers are going to toss up their hands and say, oh, you win, you know, and, and uh, shut the lights uh, when you leave or whatever. But it does mean that it is now apparently technically possible uh, for us to declare that, that they are com uh, completely uh, uh, their presence in world monetary affairs is completely otios. Uh, that we can, uh, that they are 
absolute. Okay, central bankers, that's another lecture. Yeah, that's, um, right. that's a couple lectures. Andrew Selkirk, who's an uh, archaeologist, you probably take a long-term view of this. Yes, well, I, I would just like to come down to very modern times indeed, that is the 1870s, and uh, just ask a little question about, the, make two points about the Great Depression of the 1870s. Firstly, that uh, this was the great period of the rise of the trade unions, of strikes, if you study trade unionism, they all peter out after 1896, but that's when they great grow because people were trying to push down wages in actual fact. Secondly, the plight of the house builder, you buy a house, you buy a plot of land, you build a house, you then try and sell it, but prices have gone down. But in, that, in between 1870 and 1896, every house builder went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Well, I was aware of, uh, of the fact that cer certain sectors in England, Saul talks about this in his book, of course, Myth of the Great Depression, certain mm -hmm. sectors did suffer. Agriculture suffered a lot during this yeah. period, too. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is, if you look at the real per capita GDP figures, there's no depression. And uh, uh, there's no contraction. There's no, you know, the economy's growing. The, the, there are sectors that are very, very strong, matching those that are in trouble. There are always sectors in trouble, of course. So, uh, but uh, judging by the usual way we measure uh, a real contraction or recession or contractions, uh, the evidence simply isn't there to sustain the view that that period, or at least most of it, uh, was one of it, uh, in which the economies in question were depressed. I've got um, a, a last one. Uh, you've had a shot. Uh, I'll, I'll just have a last one here. Thank you. That's uh, you. Yep. A very quick one, um, Barnstead, just for economics. When you say the evidence wasn't there, you talk about GDP, obviously, evidence, and you know, the, the only real uh, data is the Madison data about the um, what was actually happening in those periods, which is obviously not necessarily one of the Angus did a great deal of work to so actually render estimates of it, but certainly there were enormous imbalances that that productivity work was actually occurring in agriculture in, in the US and that's why agriculture which in eighteen seventies to eighties was a very, very big sector of the of the UK economy. Obviously it was smaller than it is now. I so we have these and like like put in perspective the last twenty years of China. Mm -hmm. Again big global imbalances have occurred because productivity rise in China have occurred. Mm -hmm. in manufacturing uh, separately from the rest of the world. So I'd say I question one the data of the mid century anyway, just like we question some of the data of GDP in Africa now. Um, um, the other point is about imbalances. You, know, you can have a massive increase in productivity in one part of the world, but a, but a subsequent decline in productivity or, or, or stabilization which just cause monetary imbalances. Well, as long as you have, in principle, of course, with the floating exchange rates, you have the, the productivity, the rates of the deflation you have, it can uh, be independent in the Which different countries. In the 19th century, of course. Wasn't it? No, that's right. Uh, though China didn't have anything to do with that, of course. Uh, but uh, yes, on the world gold standard, if some countries' productivity improved more rapidly than others, this would result in monetary redistributions. Though I'm not uh, sure why those would be destabilizing with free capital markets and, and relatively free trade. It's precisely why you would have aristocrats of, of Britain going to the United States to, to be heiresses. It was a huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, perhaps so. And the, but it uh, uh, might have had something to do with demographics, too. But, uh, but the point is that uh, it may be that the statistics are not what we would like them to be. But they're the only statistics we've got, and from ignorance, nothing follows, right? Uh, and uh, the statistics that, as I recall, it's been a long time since I've looked at Saul's study, uh, there's also a study for the U.S. that was never published by a guy named Roger Shields, who looked into the exact same question of the so-called depression, long depression, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, they don't just rely on uh, attempts, to the various attempts to reconstruct GDP or GNP and that sort of thing. They are looking at the indexes of production that they've been able to cobble together for a variety of independent industries and reaching the conclusion that 
there is no Great Depression or Long Depression. Uh, but I can't rep I, I can't here and now tell you exactly what the data are to which they uh, uh, resort. But uh, I can tell you that both of those works try to do a, pre do a pretty thorough job of examining whatever data there is. And they both agree that there were certain sectors, in both cases, that, uh, that certainly were. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you all for coming. Please join us for uh, a drink at the back. Uh, could I suggest that um, when you stand up, if you could sort of squash your chair?